everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today we are going to be talking to Dimitri Reyes, poet, author of Pappy Pachon, which is out now at a link that will be down below, I'm sure. Okay. I've known Dimitri for a little bit, and he's kind of fucking awesome. And he's actually the one who kind of inspired me to do the crowdfunding campaign for a book of new poems instead of doing a crowdfunding campaign for like a collection of older shit but we had a really good talk we talk about all sorts of shit like his process a lot of what went into um his book Pappy Pachon and kind of his journey as far as like where he started where he's at now kind of like the different forms the book took before he got to where he is with it. So just a couple quick updates before we uh, get into the show here. This is episode 94, I think, maybe 95, I don't know. So we're really close to episode 100, and I've gotten a few questions from you guys, but give me more. Give me your audio questions that I can play for the one hundredth episode spooktacular it's going to be fabu okay oh and i will mention this again at the end but um blood rag issue 14 is out now on my etsy shop if you want a physical copy or if you want to download it you can just download it off my website links will be down below and that also means that bunny wilds blood rag poet of the year broadside of her stuff is out now when you get one of those free with every order off my website. Show with all of this shed. Um, I guess that's it. So um, I will see you guys on the other flippity flop. Just right off the bat, can you explain the idea behind this book? Oh, yeah, sure. So it's quite interesting because the idea behind this book, it actually started with one poem, which is the titular character, Papi Pichong. It translates to Father Pigeon. And I was actually sitting and doing some research on Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rican culture and Puerto Rican tradition because I was raised uh, as a third generation American in the States. And growing up, uh, a lot of my familial line was kind of like, you know, just kind of ride the culture of America because that's how you're going to get the job. That's how you're going to learn your perfect English. That's how you're going to be able to navigate certain things. But, you know, then when I got to college, I was I felt like there was a missing piece of me. So I started kind of digging back um, into things that we weren't taught, like in U.S. history and world history um, about the island and about the Caribbean. So I was learning some of those things and I was reading this this anthology on like Puerto Rican literature. And I just had this, you know, you get those poetic aha moments. And I just pictured this bird fluttering out of the book and I just started mm -hmm. writing. I just started penning a poem down. And that's what actually became Papi Pichong later. Then I was writing my stuff for every first and 15th that's in the back, which was mm -hmm. kind of just my my Nork uh, city urban centric identity poems growing up. And then I had some of the these Rican poems also. So I was like, okay, let me start trying to compile something here. And I started seeing that you could cut Ricanness, which is like the concept of what Puerto Rican is like in a bunch of different ways. I kind of started building into what was a chat book. So it was a smaller version of a, of a full length. And I was shopping that around for a while after that. And then my grandfather, which is my last connection to, to the island of Puerto Rico, he passed away in 2021. And I had a bunch mm. of grandfather poems too, because he was kind of like my paternal figure growing up because my yeah. grandfather in the picture i actually started seeing that through the lens of having these stories because i knew he was getting up there in age of of him growing up and then coming over here and he had a falling out with with my grandmother uh through like my mother's generation when they were growing up they got divorced and they were separated for a while so what ended up happening was i was also starting to get a lot of these backgrounds of how you could actually cut a person up right so you have these ideas of alcoholism and like pride for a place but also being beaten down 
by society. But then you also have that retribution, that that return, the the penance, the feeling sorry. And then that actually gave room for joy. And I saw that just, you know, how everyone can't be cut into one person or another. We're kind of like, we're not good and bad. We exist on a spectrum. I was able to see that with him. And then I started seeing that it kind of added a different texture to the book because he was actually speaking for a certain generation of Puerto mm. Rican folks that migrated here and and what they had to go through. So it started giving cross sections between my work and his work and then kind of the mac macro aspect of what was going on culturally. You know, 2016 um, was a, a different presidential election and I could say different in many different ways. Yeah. Um, and there was a really interesting relationship that he had with the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And then also when Hurricane Maria happened, which just ravaged the island. And then afterwards, there was a lot of different, there's just a bunch of different things hanging around and just being kind of, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going in length of this, but this is the first time I'm getting to talk about it. So I'm no, it's cool. It's good. Yeah. Just seeing the trajectory of what yeah. like Caribbean Latin identity has been like up until this point and just trying to piece all these things together. Now that because of the internet, we have access to all this information. Um, yeah. we, we have access of saying, hey, we can go to the list library and study and we could look at this oral history project. Like there's more people creating shit for us to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, for the first time, a lot of people that have been living here for a while are starting to dig back into that culture that was almost trying to be assimilated out of us for our own good, uh, quote unquote. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with the piece. Have um, you been back there recently? I haven't been there at all. So that's another aspect to this, too. Uh, the book is broken up into three sections. Yeah. Uh, the first one is called Made in America, which is kind of from the aspect of my speaker, who, who I was growing up. And then Father Pigeon, the relationship with my grandfather. And then after that is Portal Pichon, where it go, it, it just opens up into um, um, reimaginations of what culture could look like, what could Americanness look like, mm -hmm. and such as that. So a big aspect of the book and why I kind of hesitated while I was building a book on Puerto Rico, I was never there before. So I'm kind of like an unreliable narrator for a piece. So mm -hmm. I needed someone to connect me to that place to know what that was like. So I connect to my grandfather. I also connect to music music and, and, and history. So mm -hmm. I also bring those kind of speakers in, in order to, to help uh, influence how I'm able to look at this book. And it allows me to do to say different things, because before I was trying to write about things that my speaker couldn't embody because it wasn't there. Right. Yeah. And I think that's such a problem for for a, a bunch of other folks, you know, like black, Latinx, Asian, e even, you know, white folks that know their lineage and haven't been able to go and travel back to those places mm -hmm. in Europe and such. We have that dual identity complex where we're here, but then there's also something there. And it's interesting how we use these different objects and symbols and oracles, really, to try to help connect us to those other pieces. Yeah. Now, you you were saying that um, the book's broken up into three pieces. And then you were saying earlier that you were originally just putting a chapbook together. Yeah. Were you, is one of the pieces just that book that you were like wanting to put together originally and then everything started falling out of it? Yeah, actually, it wasn't. It was just all one think piece while it was a chat book. But when yeah. I when I introduced my grandfather poems, I had to really think of how I was going to uh, survey the book, how I was if I was going to do things chronologically, if I was going mm -hmm. to try to, to have those ebbs and flows. And what I was seeing was that all of this stuff was kind of happening simultaneously. So in order to kind of get those cross sections of all of this stuff happening at the same time, thinking about movies like Crash and stuff, right, where everything just yeah. leaves at one point, um, all these sections could could be interpreted of happening simultaneously. So yeah, when it was a chat book, I didn't have any of the grandfather poems in yet. And maybe that's what it was missing. It was missing that piece that had me disconnected or too objective earlier. And yeah. then I was going to ask you too, your couplets, okay, there's a lot of the poems in it are broken up that way. And I wanted to know from you, like what, what makes you want to write them out that way? And then as far as like the meter goes and everything with it, like how do you determine that through your couplets? Oh yeah, that's dope. Okay. Um, so we got the question about the couplets and then meter and how I break that apart. Okay. So for the couplets, I actually just think, uh, anything that has like an even number of lineation per stanza. So like the couplets, the quatrains, the mm -hmm. stessa. I just feel like that looks a, a little cleaner and it's easier to get through. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that a lot of my stuff on the page can can appear, you know, like as page poetry, but I, I do tend to lean into the, to the spoken word narrative, like the spoken yeah. style. Um, and I think it is a bit easier for someone to follow along if the if the page looks easier on the eyes than it being kind mm-hmm. of like chunky or it being spurt spurst out. Um, I do feel like my in jams also act as uh, a bit of a bigger breath, right? It, it, it gives the readers yeah. um, to kind of hang in there. And I do a combination of the in jams as well as the punctuation. So I'll use like my yeah. comma periods or m dashes in a certain way. I didn't even know I had this many m dashes. And actually, the 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 version that you have, Matt, uh, I sent it to the proofreader, and the proofreader added more m dashes. So it's actually more Emily Dickinsonian than I thought it was, which wow. is kind of interesting uh, to be in there. But yeah, there's like a bunch of these hard stops and half stops, mm-hmm. and I really do feel like it affects the meter, right? Um, I, I try to make a poem um, on the page dictate how my reader is going to read it. Um, but I also like giving options. Um, like sometimes I'll break up a, a word that's supposed to be a compound word um, or I'll put like an ing on another line um, just to give the reader the option if they wanted to barrel right through the line and read to the next line or if they want to take that breath there. So I, I kind of try to have my poem on the page so it's a bit more of an experience for the reader. Yeah. Um, so they could kind of use a roadmap to read it the way I would or it offers some Easter eggs for them to kind of mix it up and make it their own. Yeah, because so like it. when I was reading, I've heard you read. So when I was reading it, I was trying to read it like well, hearing you read the way you read and perform and stuff like that. And I was just like, there were there were moments where I was like, now would he actually do this or am I doing this because this is what it looks like? And I'm and I was like, I was like fucking myself up. I should have just been reading the book like a normal motherfucker, but I was like totally trying to see how you would do it. And I, yeah. I was just like having a hard time with it. But um the other thing about that, like on the exact opposite side, there's a couple of like prose poem looking deals in here and one of them was really not bizarre but like it was written in the way that you would see like a poem when someone quotes a poem in an article right yeah so explain that to me and why you thought to do that yeah you know it's funny because and you're talking about the slashes it's like a box poem yeah. and has slashes in it and and the slashes are actually for those that aren't familiar with it if you're quoting something like an mla or chicago the slash will tell you that it's a line break mm-hmm. right Um, So, yeah, I do play with that a little bit. Um, I actually, one of those poems or a couple of those that are like that, I think Papi Pichong Awash was one and there might be like one or two other ones. Um, That was just me like just playing with stuff when I was in my MFA program because I got into an MFA program. I don't even know how I got into an MFA program. (laughs) I didn't know anything before I came in, right? So like sitting around all these other folks that kind of knew what they were doing and they were like experimenting with things and they were like, oh, I'm going to put a say Sura there and it's going to raise the tension of this assonance and consonance in this next line. I was like, I don't know what that is. But I I just tried to to try to hone in and try to experiment with things. So I was like, okay, let me start trying to write in prose blocks. But what ended up when I was writing in prose blocks, there was a bunch of those M dashes, those commas, those periods. And I was like, well, what else can I do? Because it's either getting overplayed or it's kind of drawing too much attention to itself and people aren't able to pay attention to the poem. So I have that situation there where I have a really weird way of speaking. I'm writing a narrative piece and I want there to be breath. So I was like, all right, let me just start working with these dashes. I mean, these slashes, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So then when I was working with these slashes, I started kind of just bringing a poem in a little more um, just so it didn't take the left to the right on the eight and a half by 11. But then with that poem specifically, Papi Pichong Awash, uh, there's a big metaphor going on about like a drowning or, or, or like hurricanes and storms um, or even like house fires and it falling on top of itself, right? Yeah. And with all of those different elements, it was giving it kind of like a claustrophobic feel. So I started trying to center marginate it until it became a perfect square. So that compounding with the slashes, um, that poem is made for the person to kind of trip up and see really weird turns and weird breaks. Mm -hmm. So I want to give the sensation of the struggle in a poem like that. So if you looked at it and it was very different and it sounds very different for people that didn't read it for me saying that I try to keep things in couplets and have them very airy, (laughs) right? I think depending on the poem, the poem is going to call for a different shape. So like even when I'm working with folks and I'm consulting with folks and they're like, oh, I like this poem, but it looks different than the other ones. Good. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. The 
the stark difference between a lot of the poems in it, like not only just break the book up, but makes each page kind of an experience when you go through it. Yeah. You know? But like, what do you think the book, the importance of the book is for a spoken word poet? Mm. Like, is it something that's like not really that big of a deal anymore? Should spoken word poets be doing audiobooks? Like what, like what is the purpose for it? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, from our conversations, and and you feel this way about a lot of things too. I'm a big proponent in just saying you got to do it all. Mm -hmm. You know, got to do it all and see what really sticks, and by what sticks, what feels good for you, and also what people are going to receive well. And that just depends on uh, whatever you're doing. Um, for this book, as a spoke as a spoken word artist, um, which is interesting because like there's spoken word, there's the page, but I also like to call myself multidisciplinary because I'm always mm -hmm. constantly thinking about like dancers and music and how I could connect with other people. Um, I, I got this uh video coming up and it might be be up on my socials by the time this come out where I'm actually doing a dancing piece while I'm speaking the poem at the same time. Um oh, wow. just to see how it exists in a different medium. Um, so I, I hope that when people see this book, they could see that there's fun and there's experimentation in there, but also that a, a spoken word poet could jive on the page and it could teach people that are used to reading that it opens them up to a different musicality of folks that kind of write in a different genre. And for, for people that are in spoken word that, you know, you can actually just publish a book with a traditional publisher and mm -hmm. it could go over really well and, and people could really like it, you know? So I, I, I think it's it's interesting because this book specifically it was a finalist in two pretty big prizes and it just didn't make the cut and then I also applied with these poems for like a state grant and it didn't make the cut and with the state grant I got some feedback and there was a bit of a confusion in, 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 the, in the formalist verse and that feedback and I think we're at a time we're at a precipice really where a, a lot of people are doing experimentation on socials um mm -hmm. Uh, spoken word poets that are that are taking to socials and making graphics and stuff they're making really cool things and then you have these literary elite like the douglas kearneys of the world for instance um that could do really crazy stuff on the page and it's passable i i, I think that people are starting to see that that verse doesn't need to be written in just one way mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that that's what people will see with this book being traditionally published. And hopefully that other traditional publishers, when they see how people like this and they see how interested they are in it. And I'm not doing anything like different or wild or or, or groundbreaking, but just feeling free to not just have that left marginated kind of form, um, have sonnets that are remixed where the, the meter is broken up in a way where it's kind of like a faux sonnet, but then also having these, these epics that take four pages, but they're songs. And and I, 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 no one really knows that yet because I haven't found a, a certain music, musician to do some of those pieces yet. But there, uh, one particular poem where uh, it says "Papi Pichong prescribes bomba," that that's actually a song with a call and response to to bomba music from the island. So yeah, I'm just hoping that people look at that and they feel like that they're able to have what they want on the page mm -hmm. and that people are going to receive it. Because I think a lot of times some people just hold back because they don't know how people are going to receive it. But yeah show them and if you believe in it they're probably going to believe in it too were you planning on doing an audio version of it at some point um actually i'm in this poets and writers like uh publishing incubator program and one of the things we were speaking about with the publicist that's leading us in this class in the beginning was to think of three crazy ideas that you want to do for this book like just pie in the sky ideas and one of them was it would be really cool to turn this this whole book into a music album um, because there is so much music in there. So yeah, I am thinking about that, thinking about the optics and thinking on how I want to do that. I, I, I want it to be like a pretty big production and it would be really nice because folks, there is money out there to get some money behind it. So you don't have to pay mm -hmm. out of pocket for it. Um, so I am thinking about how I'm going to package that maybe as in a grant proposal or something historical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would definitely like to do that with a group, uh, maybe a jazz group or a samba group, or it could be a bomba group. Uh, maybe it could be a mix of that. Right. Um, but yeah, I would love to do an audio version, but more of the of the album route. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if at some point my publisher thinks about an audio version because Get Fresh Books, uh, they've been thinking about doing audio versions for a while now. Yeah. I mean, I could see it as a stage play, you know? Yeah. Like, totally, totally. Like, just, like, especially, like, when you're describing how the story 
like goes from point A to point B and you were talking about crash and all this other stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, you can totally see that, man. Totally. You know, I've been thinking about that. My wife and I always pang around like, what's the next idea? Because we also mm-hmm. want to make sure that every book is going to be different in some way, right? Yeah. Um, we actually thought about doing a screen, uh, a, a stage play, right? Um, where everything is, the, the whole entire story is like in a bunch of monologues. And we mm-hmm. were thinking of some poems that felt more monologue-like and just stretching those out a little more into a narrative. But then the chorus is in the poems, right? The yeah. chorus is kind of giving a lay of the land. Yeah, it, it'll feel very Beat Street. Have you yeah. ever saw that film? Um, so yeah, I definitely think about that all the time. And you know, poets poets make great like playwrights and stuff too. So I just haven't dipped into it. How do you, well, I, I, I know how you feel about it, but I'd love for you to just like reiterate, like how are you feeling about the difference between prose and poetry? Because I know you also write a lot of prose and to be honest, Matt, and the people watching, that's something I'm terrified of, right? Because mm-hmm. there's so many different times you can make a mistake writing prose in terms well- of like, and tax and turning a line and stuff oh it's a it's a completely different discipline for sure but i am just too impatient now and I, not now like i've always been impatient but like i just tried to push through it but like i mean you i think in order to be successful writing prose unless you're trying to do a traditional publishing route mm-hmm. there are certain rules that you need to go by in order to be able to make a living doing it and those rules are not something i want to put myself to so like you have to put out a book every month like you have to have your book be in a series yeah you have to like just keep pumping and cranking stuff out and when if you're someone like me who likes to do something different every time like that gets really difficult and if you're not like completely conforming to Amazon category searches and mm-hmm. keyword searches. Like you're, if you try to cross genres too much, Amazon's just yeah. going to be like, fuck you. I'm not going to push your book. Yeah. So it's yeah. just a pain in the ass. Yeah. We're, we're like in the period of multiverses and serialization for everything. And, and it's wild because the stuff, yeah. if, if you look at the, the what's, what's hit, like on the KDP top or what's trending. It's all these serial versions of it. And yeah, you do see yeah. it's coming out like March, 2023, April, 2023. <clears throat> and, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions th- there too, as to what is the content of the work at that point? Because sometimes you do have to sit with it a little bit just to really stretch out your story. I, I, I would, I would imagine the, the worst thing when, when I published uh, actually both books, the, the shadow work for poets book and every first and fifteenth, and even Papi Pichon, um, mm. I'm getting that too. Was the idea of when it's like about to come out, you're like, oh man, I had this great idea that I really wish I was able to put in there, mm-hmm. but it's already to print, right? So you miss out on that, and now you got to try to see how to put that idea somewhere else. So yeah, that's <laughs> a missed opportunity. You know? That's a fun one. That's why you just gotta like make series books and just keep serializing and going to the next thing it, yeah. it's a nightmare but um i mean yeah because like when you're doing that kind of stuff you have to be writing like six thousand to fourteen thousand words a day you know just- it, it's just like morning to night you're just yeah doing it and like it's it can get to you dude i was gonna ask you too about um the cover because that looks like something that was actually made so yeah. explain that so actually this book was gonna be a self-published book first and when i was gonna self-publish it it was gonna kind of be in that chat book format so we were thinking maybe like a little under 45 pages and within doing that you know you make everything so i reached out to a friend of mine another puerto rican writer who is also a poet he's a high school teacher in dc but he's also an artist of a bunch of different disciplines so like um he'll do needlepoint which is what the cover is like but mm-hmm. he also does wood carvings and chocolate and and like screen printing like he does it all and uh during covid he he was well no it was a bit before covid he was really into like pin cushioning and 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 weaving so i said hey uh would would i be able to gift you the early version of this book and i'll pay you to just go nuts come up to what you think this is going to be and just give me a uh, give me a cover um so he was like uh so he looked at it and whatever and he was like hey I, I just got this Puerto Rican bandana flag flying around. Do you want me to do something on it? And I was like, all right, cool. 
So he stitched it up. He he sent me a picture. I was like, oh my God, this is beautiful. Then he was like, do you want your name on it? And I was like, oh, he'll put the name on it too. So we stitched my name on it. He put Papi Pichong at the top. Um, he signed he signed it on the back of the flag and he mailed it to me. He was like, here, uh, mail it and iron it before you take the picture. So I got it, I, I ironed it and then it sat there. Then COVID happened and I was like, I'm not gonna put this book out during COVID. So while I was waiting around for all that to finish, I just started sending it out to places. Um, on a whim, I sent it out to this chat book contest and it got a finalist thing. And I was like, oh, okay, there's something here. So then I started searching around some more. Then I had that epiphany with my grandfather after his death. And then that part expanded. And then I started pitching it out as, as a full length. And then the uh, the Andres Montoya prize, which is like one of the biggest like Latin letters prizes. I was like a, a finalist out of the five people. So that was like past the semifinalist into the finalist. Didn't get it, but that was like totally fine. And while that was floating, Get Fresh Books came knocking and they were like, hey, we would like this. And I was like, hey, they like it too. Can you give me like a couple more weeks? And he was like, yeah, sure, for sure. So, you know, it, it worked out in the way it was going to work out because there was a chance and this happens in big publishing and you might have talked about it before. You don't really have a, a say in what the, the finishing product is going to look like, right? Yeah. They're going to use your work. They're going to take your ideas into consideration, but a lot of bigger places have their own aesthetic for sure. um, and they'll take those things into consideration. But at the end of the day, they have to do what they feel like is going to be a better product. But when I sent this over and I floated it over to my publisher, Roberto Carlos Garcia, he was like, yeah, man, we'll make it happen. And he just wanted me to think about like dimensions for the book to make sure the flag was there. And then he was talking about those thicker, those thicker uh, poems that you were mentioning. And he was saying, okay, maybe like a six by nine would work. So that's basically how it worked out. Um, the back cover was basically the only thing the graphic designer had to do something with to fit the blurbs on mm -hmm. and the end and stuff. But I mean, in one way, logistically, it was a great piece, right? Uh, it was, it was kind of cool because you could even see kind of like the canvas stitching yeah uh, so it's like really detailed so for the graphic designer they're like hell yeah like my, my job is 75 percent here already i just got to do the spine in the back so yeah it really worked out in that way and i love it um i'm probably gonna end up framing it when i when i start doing tours just because it's such a cool piece yeah because like when i first saw the like jpeg image in one of the emails you sent out uh -huh. I, I i didn't realize the work that went into that and yeah. so when i was looking at the book it like I was like, holy shit! Like this is like, like a fucking piece of art that yes. like, it, yeah, like it tripped me out. Like it, yeah. but I also didn't know. Um, so you have been putting this book together for what, like four years now, five years? Yeah, I would say 2019 is when it started seriously becoming a thing. But there's poems in there as far back as 2016. Wow. Yeah. And actually the Papi Pichong poem as a Papi Pichong as rhetorical device, which actually happens. There is a fourth section. There's a triptych in the back. That's kind of like an afterwards. That was the first poem that I wrote in the Newark public library. And that was probably like fall of 2016. And that was a breakthrough poem. So the whole entire book actually came from a breakthrough poem. Um, when I was kind of finding that kind of voice. Um, mm. So yeah, it's been a long time coming for that. So how does that feel now when it takes that long to do? Um, was, it, was your first book, did it take that long too? or uh, The first book, I was probably from stuff from like 2015, because that's mm -hmm. when I kind of started writing more seriously and I actually started keeping all my stuff. Um, I tell everyone not to throw their shit out because I was the person that threw the shit out, <laughs> right? Uh. I was like, I was like, no, no, please don't throw it out. You just never know when you're going to need it. But yeah, how does that feel? Matt Wall asks Dimitri Reyes, how does that feel? I almost don't feel it because it's kind of a part of the game. Like, yeah. you know that you're going to have stuff that's older that's going to make it into the collection. You know you're going to have some newer stuff that's going to make it in the collection. I treat, I handle with care poems I wrote like two weeks ago the same as I handle with care like poems from when I first started writing. But it is something to kind of like acknowledge and appreciate and feel gratitude about that mm -hmm. some of those poems that you wrote then you still think are good enough now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, like so... one thing, like I've talked to poets that do th this thing the way you do it. Uh -huh. And one of the things I've heard is that it's hard to feel as connected to those poems by the time they finally come out in book form. So like, do you have, it doesn't sound like you have that same thing because of the like deep connection you have to this book. 
I think that's it. I think that's it. Um, I, I I'm interested to see if that changes as like the the next preceding books like come out. But specifically, like every first and fifteenth, that was like my growing up in the hood poems, right? That was one of my very foundational poems. And then Papi Pichong is such a connection of what like my identity has become, right? Like a, a, as a scholar, a, a, as as a brown person, as someone that like teaches, um, as someone who helps oppress, and then as someone who is a poet and and tries to help others within the community. Um, mm -hmm. and grandfather poems right and then just the pain of the afflictions of like crypto colonialism and ecology like right before we came on we were just talking about like you know I'm, I'm i'm from the east coast and we just had that really big flume of smog come down here so you know all this stuff is just so tactile and real that i still feel the same way as i felt or maybe even more so it's more it's exacerbated now from when i first actually wrote it and maybe it's just because I'm, since I'm also coming like from more of the performative side too, when I step into that poem to either revise it or to perform it again, I kind of embody it and it takes me back there again. You know, I talked about focal points becoming oracles to have access to things. And these poems are like oracles. You kind of step into the body of that poem and, and live in there for that poem. And, and you say things a certain way, you move your face a certain way. So you kind of ritualize those certain parts of the piece. I'm, I'm kind of glad to say I, I could, I could still at this point in my career, right. I, I feel very close to all the poems still, but that's also, also subject to change. Yeah. yeah. Like, what do you think to a spoken word poet who's listening to this? Like, would you say it is more important for you to put a book together and try to get the book out? Or do you think it's more important to have a presence on TikTok or a presence on YouTube? Um, I mean, I, I guess in the semantics of this question, it depends what you want to do, right? Um, if you're a spoken word poet that is consistently going to open mics, you're consistently going to features, you're getting asked to go to high schools, you're getting asked to go to colleges, you are your product. So they're paying you to be there and, and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're enjoying you while you're there. But it's always nice to have a book, even if it's kind of like, you know, the, the whole like New Yorkan, New York or Philly thing of just uh, stapling a bunch of poems together, having a blood rag magazine in the pocket mm -hmm. to get out to someone. So they have something to walk away with, right? Yeah. Whether you're doing it for free or whether you're doing it for a couple of dollars, you know, to pay for parking or to pay for bus fare or whatever. I think if you are hitting the pavement a lot, it is important to have something. If you were to have a book with an ISBN, uh, whether it's self-published or or traditionally published, that gives you uh, an easier access to places like libraries and bookstores because that's how they usually house your stuff. So when people are are talking about, oh, do you have a book yet? It's it's kind of just to have an actual thing, but. Uh, Unless if it's a place that's actually going to like get a di distribution channel in for you and order your book somewhere. When you're talking to those people, that's what they mean by the book. But when anyone is talking about, hey, do you have a book yet? They just want something. So yeah. it, it doesn't have to be, you know, like this grand law, like a big production, but it could be as personal as you want it to be. For people that are like on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, like I said, I think it's important to have your hands in different pots because that's how people discover you. That's how people mm -hmm. discover you locally. That's how we're able to talk across the country, you and I right now, yeah. right? social media presences. So I think it's important to, to do both. But if you are more comfortable with leaning into one rather than the other, you could do that too. I, I think there's merit in that as well. Like with, um, cause I, you were the first person I ever heard say this, but like for people who live in like poetry deserts, oh, you yeah. know, I'm currently like, in a poetry desert as a matter of fact. So when I'm thinking of a book tour, like in person, I have to think of staying over places in order mm -hmm. to like not break the bank. Right. Um, yeah. Everything around here besides maybe like two or three bookstores, which if anyone ever like just does a circuit, two or three bookstores, like the same people go to those bookstores. So you can't keep frequenting those places if, if yeah. you're in separate places. Everything else is like an hour or more from me. So if you are in that poetry desert, yeah, then social media um, is going to be your ace. You know, virtual mm -hmm. virtual uh, reading, virtual uh, reviews, I mean, virtual reviews, virtual like um, panels and interviews. Yeah. That's going to be your ace and creating things yourself, right? Like actually set your camera up somewhere, have a couple of takes, make a video. Um, you can overlay it and do a bunch of cool things to it, or it could just be a performative piece yourself. The creativity is limitless. As long as you feel like your creativity is limitless. Mm -hmm. um, if you are in a poetry desert, and for those of you that don't know what poetry deserts is, the arts, the arts world is bone dry where you're at. 
right? Yeah. Everyone in like a, a circle radius of like 10 or 20 miles from you doesn't know what a poem is or, or or there's no art scene for you there. Like there is like in a city, for instance, or yeah. So so that's the thing. Yeah, if you're in a poetry desert, I definitely think that's- So true. you're about an hour from the city? I'm about, I'm a, well, I'm about like 35 to 40 minutes with traffic from Philly. So that's not the worst. Yeah. I've spoken with people and that's not the worst, but I'm actually coming from a neighborhood where I could walk outside and a, a flyer could smack me in the face of an arts event that's going on that evening, right? So you could just literally <laughs> walk into a random, yeah, you could literally walk into a random bodega and someone's like, oh, you're a oh. poet. You want to come to my thing later, right? So oh, shit. Uh, it's very different. It's very different. Yeah. Um, now like i was in a place before where there was like bus stops and buses and and because buses have bus stops and then like art centers and schools right and and like a downtown district where there's galleries mm. um and people performing like in the middle of the park they just set up like a, a a milk crate soapbox and then everyone just goes there and hangs out there's people playing music in like random parts in like the college town but now i'm surrounded by like equestrian farms and I went to take my cats to the vet and I was like petting goats and steer while I was waiting for them to get seen. And if this sounds normal to you, this wasn't to me, <laughs> right? Like I would take my cats to a vet and I would just sit in a small room and just wait for them to, to bring them back out. So yeah, um, I do think that there is a lot of good stuff that's happened for, you know, taking the, the brown kid and just putting him out in the wilderness. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it gives it gives me a different kind of lens and optics and appreciation for things, but it also has just changed my game. Um, I just know I have to do things differently. I'm like about three hours away from where I used to live now. So in order to do things back in my old neighborhood, it would take a lot more planning. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually leaning into virtual things. So for those that are in poetry deserts, it's very common for schools specifically to say, okay, we could zoom you in for like an hour to do a reading and talk poetry with folks. Nice. Yeah. And what school did you go to? So I went to Rutgers Nort, which was really funny because when I was in high school and I had to take the light rail to my high school, I didn't know that I had to walk through the Rutgers Nort campus to get to my high school. And I didn't know until I actually went and I looked up the address and I was like, oh, okay, there's Rutgers Nort. So it was always in the same neighborhood as I. But that's the thing, like the, the arts and the collegiate stuff was just so intertwined with the city. It just kind of blended in. So it's very different when I come down here and go to a, a bookstore that's like 20 or 30 minutes away. And then that strip right there is where the yeah. art is. And then outside of that, it doesn't exist. Yeah, I see. I see. I get you. In your um, acknowledgements, you had quite a few um, places who had published some of the poems that were in this book. I guess this kind of answers my own question because um, I didn't know how long you'd been working on this. You had like a awesome list of places that had been publishing the poems out of there yeah thanks thanks that was like one of probably the one of the most pain in the butt things to to put together because i had to <laughs> i had to go there was so many years between mm -hmm. these poems that i had to like go back into my own website and, and be like that person that was researching myself <laughs> yeah and, well what was i publishing in like 2016 or 2017 so some of it was surprising and just i guess the pain about it was just making sure you acknowledge everyone yeah uh, because you know it's just like it's an important thing to do like uh, a book takes a lot of work to put together and the, the the most minute conversation with individuals kind of affects that book that's going to come out like like when you're when you're there at the editing spot so yeah it was it was a long list and um i i, I opted for the chunky thing and i just put a chunk of of all the publishing places instead of yeah. listing them all because yeah, yeah. it got complicated matt because some of them had multiple pieces and then i would have just been there typing and typing and putting it in the right form so i was just like all right i'm just gonna put it in the block there and yeah and then you said um uh these places have published some of these poems in different forms so did you rewrite a lot of the poems when you were putting them into a book as opposed to when you were just sending them out individually yeah that's kind of like a two-parter the, the first one which is the tldr um all the titles changed because they had poppy pichon in it so yeah. just off, off the bat that that was what was going to change it but a lot of poems did change kind of like in form and maybe like uh I, I i said certain things that i felt like could have been better or you know i like doubled back on something or i added to it some of the poems i kind of like uh fluffed up a little more so yeah the poems are going to change and this is something that i even see with poets that that read that have been reading the same poem for years it's kind of like musicians that they have to play the greatest hits when they go on it's going to be a yeah. different it's going to be slower it's going to be faster right 
Um, so even after those poems were published, when you have the option of when you're shaping this book, you could change things. And sometimes I took, I redacted some things. Sometimes I added some things. So to just, it, some of them didn't change at all, Matt, but just to blanket it, right? I, I just started out by saying that just so I could cover myself. Um, yeah. If you look at the back of a lot of books, basically every book kind of says that. Yeah. You know? So I, I kind of just like copied from other books I read for that. My question about it is, were any of the changes that were made, like editorial decisions by the different magazines that you changed back when you got the book? I think so. I think so. Um, but I'm very kind of like chill when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm like, all right, guys, I got the publication. If you want to put it there, that's fine. Right. <laughs> um send me the check um so I'm, I'm totally cool with that there are only some times where i uh sometimes i do this thing where i won't have articles in, in between some words and, and it kind of sounds kind of funky and i want it to on purpose so in those situations i'll just explain my reasoning for something or if i capitalize something and make it a proper noun when it's just a regular noun i'll just say something like oh you know i'm, act I'm trying to like poke fun at the patriarchy or capitalism mm -hmm or something like that right i'm trying to heighten that word when it doesn't really mean anything so things like that but like if if sometimes people just want to change things nine times out of ten well scratch that eight times out of ten i'll do that the only thing i'm, I'm a hard ass about is in jams right like uh if, if someone moves my in jams around yeah. yeah if someone moves my in jams around i just politely ask if i could just rework it and see if they like it and usually the in jams is because um on an eight and a half by eleven uh, folks are sometimes to write longer lines and then mm -hmm. in order to fit on their website or to fit in their print book, their margins are smaller. So For it moves real. around. Yeah. So that's like the only thing that I would yeah. probably consider something that I'm a stickler about the in jams, which goes back to like our first question. Yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah. yeah Cause I was going to ask you like some of your lines are quite long. Yeah. And so when you're reading those, like, I don't know if like you have like a Ginsburg kind of deal, like when you're like reading stuff like that, where it's like, this line's going to be as long as I can have a breath kind of thing. Right. Or if you have put a lot more thought into those. Um, it's kind of serendipitous. It, it just depends. When, when I'm kind of just writing just a long hand real quick, I just type the whole poem out and then I break mm -hmm. it up a bit later. But sometimes with those longer lines, if it's a situation where there isn't like the comma, you know, the quotation, the period or whatever, yeah. um, I, I rely on the stressed and unstressed uh, sounds and those sounds that are stressed like this. I'm going to take a break, even if it's midline. And then for the person that's reading it, they just have the option of taking a break when they feel like they need to take a break. Yeah. Funny thing for, for those that are like trying to learn like how I read the poems as I'm writing them. If I ever have thin lines, I'm probably barreling through them. Like, like if it's kind of more of like a skinny poem, I see. Yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. With anxiety, I'm trying, I, I try to barrel through those lines a little more, but yeah, like the long line lengths, the other thing about that is like sometimes after the poem, I just break it up to make it look a little pretty. Mm -hmm. um, and the I, I really concentrate on the words that end the line, like even with like folks that I help with revision and stuff like that. I'm I'm a very big proponent of like trying to end the line with a verb because it's it's action. So it's going to yeah. move the person to the next line. Um, if you end the line with a noun, it raises the importance of that subject. Right. Um, if you end it with an adjective, the person is going to be kind of nosy and they're going to want to know what you're connecting the adjective to in the next line that's going to get them there. So those are kind of like my three tenets when i'm trying to do the line breaks yeah that's good in order to have someone really try to keep on reading because i think that's the goal right yeah. whether you're a performance poet or or a poet that's on the page you just want to have that person be enthralled from beginning to end yeah you, you got to definitely try to get them there making people excited to find out what happens next no matter what it is for real yeah, like i yeah. dig that um who got you into poetry like wh like wh who did you read where you were like oh man i gotta ah, fucking do still. this no honestly bro i don't even know how it happened like um i think maybe like the earliest well, woo, 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 let me taking it real back, right? Um, I was kind of like in middle school and grammar school, writing kind of came easy to me. And mm. I know, and we know this for a fact now because like uh, my wife knows that like math is just not my thing. And yeah. it's fortunate because like after seventh grade, I was just like, oh, writing's my thing. I could, I could coast and I could just get my B or C in math, right? Yeah which is terrible. Kids go, go do your math. It, it really Numbers helps. are fucking hard. dude. <laughs> it, yeah. It, it really helps. Um, so the earliest thing I got, I got like this feature in highlights magazine, like in second grade mm -hmm. a picture prompt. And then that was like, what put me into the tra trajectory of people saying, Oh, like he's a good, uh, he's a good writer. 
Um, so, you know, I write here and there, I got like a perfect score on like a state essay exam or whatever. Um, and that was kind of like a big deal, but I was like, eh, I'm playing Pokemon. It's fine. Um, so then I went into high school and one of our, our like, you know, how like, like you get homework in the summer, uh, mm -hmm. our one assignment was to like create a poem uh, off of a book we read. And I wanted to do that because it was getting late. I was procrastinating and that was the easiest thing for me to do. So I did that poem first and it ran, went over really well. And what then, book? I think it was Speak or Silent to the Bone. Do you not have this poem anymore? Because you just said that you're not throwing your stuff away. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I, I wasn't throwing my stuff away after like 2015. <laughs> but yeah, I threw that out. And I think for uh I think for one of my college entrance exams, I had to write a poem too. And I and I and I had a poem in there too, and I ended up throwing it out. Mm. There's a couple of other ones I wrote like in my late teens that I ended up throwing out too. But yeah, so don't throw out your poems, everyone. This is your your PSA and your reminder. Don't throw them out. They, they might be worth something later. Yeah, you know, you for real. Form them into something else. So it wasn't really until I got into college that I started liking poetry more. I took a couple of poetry classes, but not of the creative writing of variety. Um, just of kind of just like a critique and criticism. Yeah. So kind of writing essays on that stuff. And I started getting really good at that. And even when I was in my other classes, I, I was able to kind of read between the lines for a lot of books in certain ways that kind of attracted the professors and mentioned that to me. So I was like, okay, there's something there. Then I took my first uh, creative writing class. I liked that a lot, but I was so far into my like undergraduate degree already i changed my major folks like six times i didn't know what the heck i wanted to do with myself so by the end I, I didn't take anymore but i did tell a professor that i was a budding poet at some point and that one of the last classes i took was a comics and graphics novels class coolest class i ever took coolest professor i ever took i didn't know that that professor was actually a graduate of the mfa program in poetry but i told oh, him I was wow. a poet and you know how poets when uh, people hear other people saying that they're poets and they're kind of just like kind of like crap you know crapping on themselves they're like no 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 wait wait and red ink he put talk to me after class about this poem stuff and i was like oh man i'm in trouble so he i got i went up to him and he was like you think you're a poet uh i would love for you to show me some of your stuff so I sent him some of my stuff. He was like, yo, this is really good. You should actually think of going to grad school. You should apply to an MFA program. Uh, going back to the beginning of this conversation, Matt, I told you that I didn't know what an MFA program was. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, all right, cool. I'll do it. Uh, I was like, yeah, but you know, like I don't got the money. Everything's fully paid for right now. He's like, yeah, it's a fully funded program. For folks that don't know about MFAs, there's only maybe like a handful of fully funded MFA programs in the country. They're highly competitive. And I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll do it. Cause I'm still kind of a feather in the wind. So I thank him so much. His, his name's Michael Van Kalberg. He's a poet. You all should like look him up. He writes a lot of uh, stuff like on the Midwest and the Rust Belt. Really, really cool guy. Um, he, he like went through my whole entire application process with me. He went through my, my manuscript sheaf, which was going to be like 10 or 15 pages I had to bring in. He went through my personal, uh, my, let my personal letter, my personal statement. I mean, um, he wrote me a letter of recommendation. He knew a lot about my background and like me being estranged from my family and like kind of just pulling myself up by my bootstraps type stuff. And then I went to a couple professors that wrote me really good recommendations. And I do think that it was the recommendations and, and me seeing that I would hustle that really got me into the program. And then once I was in the program, I said, oh, I guess I'm a poet now. And then that's when all the research started. I went into my first class. I didn't know what a lot of the terminology was. So while I was studying the curricula that we had set by our professors, I was also copying down on the side of, of, of my papers, everything that my colleagues were saying. Because at this point, some of them won prizes. Some of them had been to conferences like Bread Loaf or Cave Canum. And I didn't know what these things were. So I was looking that kind of stuff up too. And if you don't know what those things are, um, those are residencies that you could actually apply for. And you could stay there for a couple of weeks at a time, like in a cohort of folks where you all kind of like a trade knowledge, but then also you kind of become a part of your own family and you kind of trade connections. And it's the nepotism that's supposed to tip nepotism, right? Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like a... It's usually, uh, uh, Matt, also communities of of folks that are minorities are not actually seen in the wider publishing sphere. Mm -hmm. And when they get in their spots, they kind of look out for each other and they just kind of try to even the odds because if anyone knows anything about like the big four of publishing, it's it's very like intense to kind of squeeze your way into those things. So people like in middle administration and stuff, they really try to help out. So those are really good things to go to, not only because of that, like the politicking aspect that you just can't escape from that kind of, of publishing, but also the fact that you create kind of like a fellowship 
with a bunch of other folks that are writing with you that are, that are caring about the work that you're doing and you all get to grow together. Sometimes you create lifelong friendships with some of those people, but this is to say, I didn't know what any of that stuff was. Right. Yeah. So um, I was doing things that my colleagues were saying, I was copying things that my, that my professors were saying, and then I kind of built up to be this poet, but dude, I remember like the first poem that I brought into class. I, I was like, I just wrote it. I felt really good about it. It was a dream poem. There was like, there was like, um, what's that called? Um, inception stages in it. Mm-hmm. it was really weird. Uh, it wasn't that great. So when everyone read it, they were kind of like, what is this? And they were trying to be really nice to me. And I, mm-hmm. and I knew that they were trying to be really nice to me. And so I had a lot of my beginning of my MFA and like so, so much thanks to like my wife that like kind of helped me, coached me through it. And, you know, some, some of the friends from the MFA program that were like kind of really held me down. But there was really a point where I was like, yo, I just don't know what I'm doing here. And I'm going to stop. And actually, Papi Pichon was one of those breakthrough poems that told me I could be a poet. So mm. always for those, you know, like uh, yeah. going to come. And and then the other part of, of it, too, is if you like the poem, that's fine. <laughs> and that's what I teach now. Right. Yeah. Like even other people are like, yo, what is this? Like if you are liking the poem and you're vibing with the poem, someone's going to connect to it. You know, you just got to find those right people to connect to it. Yeah. And I took that in a lot of different ways. I'm so sorry about matt that has to edit this later matt i'm sorry matt oh, no, dude. <laughs> i'm sorry matt from the future it's it's perfectly fine dude shit thank you so much for doing this dude this was great yeah thank you matt thanks so much for having me and thank you for everything uh that you're doing for the youtube community you are holding it down in your corner of the poetry youtube community world oh, um and it's a joy you know i i i love that you love having fun with mm-hmm. what you're doing and and that's the most important. And I'm I'm glad to see that fostered uh, in your comments and in your community. Everyone, please continue hating Matt Wall because it's really good for his self esteem and for his channel. Keep smashing that like button. Keep on hating. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I'll just clip that and put that at the end of everything I fucking do. That was great. yeah, god, that's your endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Take it. That's yours. That was my chat with Dimitri Reyes. Again, Pappy Pachon is available now. There will be a link down below where you can pick that up. Um, also, things that are available right now, besides um, Blood Rag, Issue 14, and Bunny Wilds thing. Um, let me get over here. Remember, Winner Your Mom Sodomy Prize for Poetry, out now. Bloodshed Review, Issue 2, pick that up, out now. Poems by Mindy Simmonson, Bunny Wild, and Rich Boucher. And last but certainly not least, Drinking Less by me. Uh, the print version in my hand right here, limited to 45 copies, each with a unique wine stain on the cover. Each book is signed and numbered. Get this on my Etsy shop or get the digital version on my Etsy shop or listen to the audio version here on my YouTube channel. Okay? So next week, oh, we're like we're totally in butt plug territory here, like we are plugging butts. But next week, Bloodshed Review issue three will be out, and that has poems from Jeff Taylor, Adam Crawford, and Tamara Albana. So with all of that, let's get into those motherfucking shout outs. Shout outs. First, I want to give a big thank you to. All you motherfuckers over there on Patreon, I want to give a thank you to Michael, to Cedar, to Harry, to Monse. You guys are delicious. And then for those of you over in the YouTube thank you crew, I want to give a thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia, and to Lauren. You guys make the sunshine. Then for you big swinging effing disco balls over there in the anarchy crew i want to give a big thank you to bunny to nate to Mitty to thomas to tim j to shaylin to tim g to chill baby to tamra to adam to chase to jh to jessica to jason and our newest member of the anarchy crew jeff thank you so much for spending your quality time with us and now you know what time it is For the biggest of all fucking thank yous in the fucking world, it goes out to our number one chappie over there in the chat book of the month club, Caitlin! Thank you, Caitlin. You make smiles wider 
and brighter. So thank you. And if you would like to join the Anarchy Crew or Chapbook of the Month Club or any of these wonderful fun things, what you need to do is get over there to YouTube, click the join button, pick your tier, and then enter. Enter swiftly. Okay. Or you could just be a banging motherfucker and go over to Patreon and support over there. Any amount of support, however you do it, on any of these tiers or platforms is greatly fucking appreciated. So make sure you get those questions in. Just send your questions to ihatematwaltgmail.com. And yeah, and soon, very soon, we will be having more videos and more podcasts. More questions answered. More questions asked. Okay, gorgeous. You know the drill. Top hard, everybody. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.